What would you do if someone cheated, out, cheated you out of money? I would bet that some of you have been cheated out of money. What did you do? So if your employer owed you a month's income, refused to fork it over, if someone scammed you out of the deed to your home, or your insurance company refused to pay for cancer surgery that you needed for the sake of your health or your life, what are your options? One, obviously, is that you could sue, as it's set up in our justice system, in, in a civil court. Take them to court. Small claim, something larger, perhaps. The other option, as I see it, is you can give up. I mean, I guess you could write a letter. You could uh, appeal to the employer or the insurance company. But failing one of those options, you, you lose your, your money, you lose your property. But what if it's a fellow Christian who has your money? What if it's someone in this church who's your employer who hasn't paid what you owe for the work that you've done? What if it's an, an insurance adjuster in our congregation? Maybe you were in business together and the deal that you, you knew it was going to make a pile of money, the deal went bad, and one of you is out some money. and The other, by the arrangements of the deal, really owes what's lost back to you. What are your options then? Is a lawsuit an option? Or are you condemned to lose everything? Well, something like that happened in Corinth Church. Corinth Church in the first century, 2,000 years ago. One church member, as we'll see in a moment, has a grievance against another. In fact, if the context is our guide, one Christian has done wrong and has defrauded a brother. I suspect this is why back in chapter 5 we saw that Paul was addressing swindlers in the congregation. It seems, it seems likely, at the very least, that there were one or more people within the church in Corinth who were taking advantage financially of their brothers and sisters. So this brother, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we'll see he, he took the swindler, the defrauder, to the Roman court to get his money back property back, whatever had been lost. And does that seem reasonable to us? If that's the remedy that the secular law provides, wouldn't it make sense that that's the natural step we would take to get what was unjustly taken away from us back in our possession? It might seem reasonable to us, but it does not seem reasonable to Paul. You will see that in a moment in the way Paul addresses this very kind of situation in the beginning of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Before, but before we get to that, I want to sum up this sermon in one sentence, okay? I want to catch the whole theme in one sentence. Here it is. Practice for royal life in Jesus' kingdom by settling disputes inside the church. Practice for royal life in Jesus' kingdom by settling our disputes that are inside the church. I hope you'll see this morning a, a, a simple principle for right now, simple principle for the present, and an eternal principle, like a principle that is forever. I'll begin by reading, then I'll begin to explain what those principles are. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, I'll begin in verse 1, read all the way down to verse 8. When one of you has a grievance against another... Does he dare to go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more than matters pertaining to this life? So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers? But brother goes to law against brother and that before unbelievers? To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves wrong and defraud even your own brothers. I told you there's a, 
a simple principle for today and then uh, an eternal principle. And the simple principle for the present is this. Settle disputes that are internal to the church inside the church. Settle disputes inside the church. I hope you could sense Paul's tone as I read his series of questions to the Corinthians. Do you not know? Can you not see? Do you not understand? Paul is not asking these questions because he's curious about their opinions. He has an opinion. He knows what they, what they ought to know. The answers are obvious. These questions that Paul asks, he asks with incredulity. They're questions of astonishment. I mean, you saw there in the end of verse 1, how dare you take brother or take a brother against the law? What's happening in Corinth church? What's happening is outrageous. It should have been obvious to them that they ought not to behave this way, taking their professing Christian brothers into the Roman civil courts. I mean, they should have already known these things. Listen to the things that they should have already known. Look at verse 2. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Don't you already know this? And if you'll judge the world, you know, how much more should you be able to judge these trivial matters? Money and property? Those don't feel like trivial matters to us. But Paul's saying they ought to have a perspective that calls these property disputes trivial in relation to something greater. There in verse 3, something else they should have known. Saints will judge angels. Okay, if you'll judge the world, verse 2, and if you'll judge angels, verse 3, how much more should you be able to judge matters related to this life? If you will one day, saints, judge angels, beings that are real, that are active in, in God's creation, beings that have real power, as we find in other passages of Scripture, if you will one day sit somehow, I don't know how, in judgment over them, then how much more should you be able to exercise good judgment over the relatively simple matters of this life? Paul even corrects them in verse 5. I mean, remember, remember how wise the Corinthians think they are? You go back through our study of chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4. You see that Paul knows the Corinthians think they're wise in matters of this world and in spiritual matters as well. Well, he says, he says here in verse 5, if you're really so wise, surely there must be somebody wise among you, someone with enough good judgment, someone with the capability to settle these disputes inside the church. Well, what do they do instead? Verse 6, brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. They're taking these matters to the Roman civil courts, it seems. They're taking them before people who, Paul says in verse 4, they have no standing in the church. Now, that does not mean that secular courts have no legal authority over Christians, as some might want to interpret this to say. It doesn't mean that at all. It means the judges, the judges that they were taking their disputes to, had no understanding of Jesus' kingdom, had no understanding of what really what biblical justice looked like, had no understanding of how the church ought to function as, as Jesus' people in community, in love, in relationship, committed relationship with one another. The Roman judges just did not understand these things. They're taking these matters, these internal disputes, before people who have no standing inside the church, just no understanding of what the church is and what Jesus designed it to be. I mean, the Christians would never go to these judges for, for spiritual advice or even wise counsel about, about anything of importance. They want them to solve the property, the financial problems. These men are unreliable. I mean, I think that's the, what's, what's the issue in verse 1 when Paul says that they are unrighteous. Do you, does he dare to go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Now, this could mean simply these Roman judges were not, were not Christians. They didn't, did not understand the gospel. They didn't worship Jesus. But based on what we know of the Roman civil court system, it seems likely that they actually were corrupt, okay? So the Romans were known for having a, a pretty good, especially for its time in history, known for having a good, fair, just criminal court system. A civil court system was an entirely different matter. They were known for corruption. 
They were known for the opportunity that the rich and powerful had, the opportunity that the well-connected had to tip the scales of justice, to use their power, their money, their influence to swindle those who had less of it. And that's what the Christians are doing here. They're taking their internal disputes into the unjust Roman civil courts. And it's possible, we can't know this from the text, it's certainly possible that there were Christians who were taking other Christians into the courts and using using their power, their connectedness and influence in the Roman courts to defraud their brothers. That may be what Paul says down in verse 8 when he says, uh, when he says in chapter 6, verse 8, you yourselves wrong and defraud even your own brothers. Now, it's, it's one thing to say, you know, hey, hey there's, there's a better way to do this. But Paul says more than that. Look at verse 7. To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? Paul's saying, having a lawsuit at all, it's a lose-lose situation. Even if you win, you lose. You're taking your own dirty laundry, the disputes within the church, and airing it all out in front of the pagan world. How's that going to make the the gospel message appear before the the pagan Romans? It doesn't say that explicitly. It seems to be the argument. It's also... What G- the same kind of thing that Jesus said back in the Sermon on the Mount. You remember back in Matthew chapter 5? You don't need to turn back there. I'm just going to read a short portion. Jesus said, you have heard that it was said in the Old Testament law, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, this is the rule for Jesus' people in his kingdom. Do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. What we're seeing here in 1 Corinthians 6 is Paul's application of Jesus' general principle to a very specific life situation inside the the church in Corinth. So friends, there's no mistaking Paul's point here. We must not take our disputes with fellow church members to civil courts. This part of it, Paul does not say explicitly. It seems that his broader argument is that we're making Jesus and the church and his kingdom and the gospel message look bad when we take our profession of faith into the courts. People know we're Christians, but then they see that our lifestyles aren't any different from the pagans around us. We defraud just like they do. We fight and claw for our rights just like they do. Maybe even distort justice just like they do. And as I say this, brothers and sisters, I know that this text makes of us difficult demands. It feels very uncomfortable to think that someone that we love could swindle us, defraud us, and we then have no recourse to the court system, though we do have recourse within the church. I mean, what Paul is saying here is, Find somebody. Almost, it's almost like he says, find anybody. Surely there's somebody in the, in the church who has the capability to help you settle this, to resolve the conflict, to, to show you what is just. Now you know that we as a church do not have the power to force anybody to write a check to somebody else, even if it's obvious that person A own, owes money justly to person B. We can't take the money out of the account. We can't force him to write the check or hand over the cash. All we have is the process of judgment that we saw in chapter 5, right? That shows us just how seriously we should take the kind of judgment, the authority that that the church has in chapter 5. No, we can't take your money away, but we can say your profession of faith does not give evidence of being true. You are living like a non-Christian in refusing to act with justice towards the person you owe money to. And so, on the basis, we could say, on your refusal to make your defrauding right, we hand you over to Satan for the destruction of your flesh. That is a far more serious verdict than you have to hand over some money. 
because it has eternal repercussions. And friends, we have dealt with these kinds of issues at High Point. There were few things that we dealt as elders that were more complex than these disputes among members. Lord, may God give us the grace and the wisdom and the love for each other and the the right sense of biblical justice to be committed to doing what is right, to, 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 to fix ways in which we have unjustly taken from others. But there's a bigger issue here than lawsuits. There's a more fundamental principle. Yes, there is a simple principle for the present, but there is a, a fundamental principle that is forever in this text. It's a principle that should transform the way we see ourselves, transform the way we see our church and our place in this world. Because brothers brothers and sisters, this text may look like a passage about lawsuits. This may seem like a sermon about how to make things right with other Christian brothers and sisters. But it is deeper than that. This is really not a text just about lawsuits. It is a text about our eternal status. It's a Bible passage about your fundamental identity as a citizen of Jesus' kingdom under his authority. This is a sermon about who we really are. It's about our identity. Hot word, right, in in our society today related to identity. This is a passage about your eternal identity, who you are forever, and how that identity shapes the ways you live in the world and think about the world, the way you think about what you possess. This is a text that demands that we reevaluate what is precious to us today, because this fundamental principle that is a forever principle is this, practice now for royal life in Jesus' kingdom. Practice now for royal life in Jesus' kingdom. And you might say, Ben, where are you getting this? Let me explain, all right? We can find places in the Bible, can't we, where we get rules with little to no explanation. God makes rules, and he doesn't always explain himself as much as we would like, right? So we read in Genesis 2, there's this garden full of trees, and God picks this one and says, eat of all the other trees, don't eat that one, because on the day you eat of it, you'll die. That's all he says. No rationale, just a penalty. God doesn't have to give explanation. We go further into the Bible. We come to Exodus 20, Ten Commandments, Mount Sinai, Israel formed as a people. This is the the constitution for your life as as my people on this earth, as my nation. The, The passage begins, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. That is the only explanation for all the laws that come after it. I am the Lord your God. And he goes on into the Ten Commandments that you know. And he ends with, you shall not bear false witness. You shall not covet. It's not as if God was just going after crimes that have victims. You know, thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. No, he gets to coveting. Okay? Crimes of the heart. Who's that hurting? God reigns over it. He makes the rules. Kids, kids, if your parents ever give you ever give you a rule, and you said, but why? And then what did they say next? Because I said so. Because I'm your dad, because I'm your mom, and you're going to obey me. That's what they said. Yeah, I got that move. I got that move, right? Because I said so. Look, friends, whatever, whether we as parents should give an explanation or not, God doesn't have to give any other explanation other than I am the Lord your God. And so God gives commands and doesn't give explanations. But but here in 1 Corinthians 6, we get an explanation if we read carefully. This isn't one of those places where God says, just obey me because I said so. No, he tells us why we obey this command about lawsuits. Saints will judge the world. That's us, saints. Remember, we talked about this way back in chapter 1. Saints aren't just the really good Christians who maybe did a miracle and then the Pope gives them a title. No, saints are everybody. It's the whole church. You are fundamentally a saint if you're one of Jesus' people. You've repented and believed the gospel. 
saints, all of us, will judge the world. We'll judge angels. Is this good angels? Is this some judgment that we are a part of on the demons? I'm not sure. The Bible doesn't tell me enough to know. I do know this. If we looked over in Hebrews chapter 2, we would read this. Hebrews 2, chapter 2, verse 5. It was not to angels that God subjected the world to come. Now, we can look in places like Daniel and in places like Ephesians and see that there are spiritual powers that have influence, that have power in this world. But the world to come is not subject to angels. No, it's subject first to Christ, but even beyond that to all humanity, all of Jesus' people. He quotes them. The author of Hebrews quotes from Psalm 8, where we see that the angel's place above human humanity is temporary. The day is coming when the saints will rule over angels, just like Paul says here in 1 Corinthians 6. You see, God created mankind to reign. You need to understand that, and you need to understand that the time of our reigning has not been set aside forever. I mean, go back to Genesis chapter 1. I do this every Sunday. You know this. Genesis 1, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them what? Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God designed mankind in his image, and his image has to do with sonship and authority that comes from him. Genesis 1.28, he reaffirms this. He says, God bless, the uh, scripture says, God bless them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over, over every living thing that moves on the earth. Adam and Eve's sin that we find in Genesis 3 limits that dominion. They're exiled from the garden. No longer can they cultivate the garden, expand it to fill the earth. But that is not, that fall and exile is not the final end of God's design for mankind to have authority. Because you see in Psalm 8, you have given him, you've given mankind dominion over the works of your hands. You've put all things under his feet, specifically in the person of Jesus. We read the passage in Daniel. Evil seems to win. It seems as if these beasts are, are winning the day until the Ancient of Days. The Son of Man, Jesus Christ, arrives and judgment is not merely in his hands, but judgment was given for the saints of the Most High. And the saints possess the kingdom. Paul writes it more plainly in 2 Timothy 2. He says, if we endure, we will also, what? We will reign with him. Then we come to the, to the very end of the Bible, to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, verse 6. Those who share in the first resurrection will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. Okay? And then at the end, okay, whatever your eschatology is, whatever you believe about the millennium, and whether that's happening now or later or whatever, you get to the very end, Revelation chapter 22. By this point, we are in the new heavens and the new earth, the state that God has designed for us for the rest of eternity. And at that moment, the Lamb's servants will reign forever and ever. It's clear. God designed us to reign, and our sin hasn't ended that reign for all time. Understand what you're seeing here. So put your eyes back on 1 Corinthians 6. Understand that you are not just seeing rules for how we get our money back when we're in the middle of a dispute. No, you're not seeing mere, mere rules. You are seeing eschatology. You are seeing doctrine of the future. No, it doesn't say anything about the rapture doesn't say anything about the tribulation. We'll save that for another day. I promise, Lord willing, if Jesus doesn't come back first, we'll get there someday. But right now, right now, this passage talks to us about our identity forever and how that forever life has broken into this age inside the church. What we're seeing is that God has designed for his people to live like kings, which we will be forever but to live like royalty in this age right now inside the church. God has designed his church to be, and I know we fail in this way, but he's designed for us to be a paradise for his people to live in, in peace, in love, in affection, in righteousness with each other. That's what you're seeing here in 1 Corinthians 6. 
you are seeing Paul tell you who you will be forever and call on you to live now like the royalty that you already are. We've had an unusual perspective on life as royalty over these past couple weeks, haven't we? And by royalty, I mean a very limited version, a very limited version in comparison with eternal reign with Jesus. We've merely seen a picture of of royalty that's the picture of, you know, basically a figurehead role in the backstages of what was once a, a nearly worldwide empire. Now it's a crumbling empire. But we can still see pictures, little pictures, can't we, of a different way of life where small children, princes in line to the throne, are expected to act differently than we ordinary, we commoners might expect our children to act. In 1936, many of you will know the story, English King Edward VIII abdicated. He quit the throne. He was the king, and he quit, that, he, he quit because he wanted to marry someone that he couldn't marry and remain king. Immediately, when he abdicated, his younger brother Albert became King George VI, and that meant that his daughter, Elizabeth, who was then 10 years old, immediately that little girl went from having a relatively normal royal life to being the likely next monarch of the nation of England. Her life changed immediately. The story is told, it's told by a number of different people, I assume it's true. Her sister, her younger sister, said, does this mean that you'll be, actually, does this mean that you have to be queen one day? And Elizabeth, age 10, said, yes, someday. And her sister Margaret said, poor you. (laughs) And you can imagine in some ways that that must have been true. I mean, just imagine in that moment, in that moment, not of her father's death, but of her uncle's abdication, everything changed for her. The expectations changed. The scrutiny changed. Her Her education changed. All of a sudden, her mother, I believe it was Queen Mary, her mother started teaching her about monarchical dynasties, their history throughout humanity, especially in England. Started going to museums all the time, and her, her mother made sure that she read the Bible. Thanks be to the Lord for that. But Paul would say to us, do you not know that you are royalty? Do you not know that you are in line to a throne? Brothers and sisters, do you not see now that your life is preparation to rule over the universe under the authority of King Jesus? We reign, we saw it from all those different texts, we reign with him. You have authority. You have authority now. And the sphere of that authority that you have is the church. I mean, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians that the church is is made up of ambassadors. We are functionally an embassy. And you probably know, an embassy of another nation, you know, the the Russian embassy or the Canadian embassy or or, or whatever embassy you may want to pick out, their land in, in the United States where that embassy sits is foreign soil. It's the property of that foreign country. It's foreign soil, right? Same thing for our embassies in places like Mongolia, or, or, or China, or, or Japan, or wherever it may be. Our soil, surrounded by a foreign country, inside that embassy, the people live according to the accountability that they have from their home country. Okay? Their primary, account, primary accountability is not to the, to the nation they're surrounded by, but to the nation that has sent them to declare the message from the governing authority in that nation. Similar, similarly, we as a church, we are foreign soil. We are an an outpost of God's kingdom in this age, in this world that is ruled over by the prince of the power of the air. And we are charged, we are charged to spread a message, a message that I pray you hear from this church every week. The message is this, Jesus reigns and he is coming and he will judge. There is one way and only one way to escape the judgment of that king, surrender to him. Jesus sends us with the message that this world is in rebellion against him, and it must reconcile to him. He offers peace. He offers forgiveness from the treason and rebellion of this world. 
but only by turning from that rebellion to profess allegiance to him and to him alone, to come to him not by means of works that we might do, but by his righteousness and faith in his shed blood and broken body offered for us. That is the only way that this world can find reconciliation with Christ. And we are sent as his ambassadors. So I stand before you now, my friend, if you are among us this morning and you are not reconciled to Jesus because you are persisting in rebellion against him, you're living a life breaking in, in, in a pattern of willfully breaking his laws, and you have never turned from that, then I plead you to trust in him now. Plead for his mercy now, and he will grant it now. But friends, that is our message. Trust the mercy of Christ. Believe that he has already executed the death sentence for our rebellion upon his own son. So since we are under Jesus' authority, live. Now, live like our community is under his authority. Give the world a taste in the way we live with one another, in the way we not only avoid lawsuits with each other, but seek to reconcile within the church, in the way that we live and love and care and provide for one another. Give the world a taste of what kingdom life is like. In whatever means the Holy Spirit allows to us, in whatever way he fills us to accomplish it, show the world what the new heavens and new earth is like not at each other's throats trying to defend our rights under human law, but graciously, even willingly, relinquishing our rights and our property for the sake of a far greater inheritance that is ours in eternity. Friends, we need to understand that we as the church are not here to try to survive. Jesus made us for so much more. The church is not treading water. Not if Jesus' words are true. We're not just barely keeping our head up from drowning. No. The church of Jesus Christ does not play defense. When we read Jesus' words that the gates of hell will not prevail against his church, that's, that's like hell is under siege from Jesus' kingdom. And those walls are coming down because Jesus' kingdom reigns. Your mission is not to play defense. Your mission is with confidence, not in us, but in the power of the Holy Spirit and the message about King Jesus and his coming arrival to go out with that message in the world and to reinforce that message, to authenticate that message with our lives. That is our mission. That's why the kinds of decisions this church makes, the decisions we made last week in our members meeting about church membership, they are more important than any vote you will ever cast for a public official because those officials will have a few years in office. But the kingdom of Jesus and those who enter into it will be there for all eternity. But, but, one last thing we have to consider in verse 8. You yourselves wrong and defraud, even your own brothers. understanding what we considered about Jesus' kingdom, about our identity, about eschatology, the kingdom coming in and now. This ought to show us that we, as Christians, still sin against one another. In the church in Corinth, they were the, it, it was a Christian who was the guilty party. So while Paul is rebuking the person who was aggrieved, the person who had suffered loss for taking his brother to court, it was a legit claim. It was a Christian brother who had defrauded him. It's kind of like that old urban legend, you know, where the, you know, the call is coming from inside the house. That's where the threat is. Well, in this situation, the sin was coming from inside the house, threatening the unity of the church. And it ought to be unimaginable that we would tolerate evil in the Christian community. This is Paul's argument back in chapter 5. You're tolerating this guy? Who's in this immoral relationship? You're tolerant, you're proud about it? You're celebrating your welcoming spirit? You purge the man from among you. We as a congregation ought to be deeply disturbed by church leaders who have abused those under their care. We thank God that we are aware of nothing like that in this congregation. 
If it exists and you know about it, then you need to act immediately. If a law has been broken, if a person has been taken advantage of or abused, and especially if it's a child, then you need to call the authorities. That's the first thing you need to do. But we ought to be deeply discouraged by church leaders, by churches that we have been in partnership with who have not cared for those who have been under the, their authority, but those who have, but in some cases have abused those under their care. We are right to fire lawyers who encourage churches to cover these things up. We ought to do all we can to make sure that we have nothing to do with it. This is one reason your pastors, your pastors here at this church are probably more engaged than most pastors in our partnerships with other churches because we see things that have been tolerated, that have happened, and we are deeply offended by it and determined to root it out. This is one reason why, why we committed some time a couple years ago to help, to help change laws in Texas, to make it easier for churches to warn other churches about threats without getting sued. We wanted to reduce the number of lawsuits among Christians and also to help the vulnerable, vulnerable be protected. And thank the Lord, thank the Lord the law in the state of Texas is different now because of work that we were a part of. Too often, pastors and churches and partnerships between churches have failed. And we have a responsibility as royalty to do everything we can to see that it is not tolerated among Jesus' people. We have failed. Christians in the United States have failed, just as royalty has often failed, just as you can think of so many stories about British royalty where British royalty has brought shame upon the people of that nation. Just like in verse 5, verse 5 here of chapter 6, I say this, Paul says, to your shame. But friends, we have hope because shame, failure does not change who we are, does not change our identity, cannot, cannot shake our eternal identity. These Christians in Corinth, they defrauded each other. And they were responsible to deal with it in light of who they were forever. But we have hope that despite our failure, the Father receives us because his own son suffered wrong and was defrauded in our place for our sin. He saw our failure to deal with sin among us, and he took the shame for that upon himself. And so, my brothers and sisters, I ask you today, do you understand who you are? Do you believe that you are part of God's royal family by choice, adopted into it, and are, and are you prepared to live? Are you prepared to live who you are, who you forever will be? And are we prepared to pay the price in this life? walk as children of light, as citizens of Jesus' kingdom, authenticating his message in the world. Let's pray. Our Father, we pray that you would show your mercy to us as your people. to keep these sorts of disputes from even arising within our congregation. That Lord, if and when they do, oh, Father, give us a taste for your eternal kingdom, for the treasure, the inheritance, the identity, the blessing, the joy, the rest, the reconciliation, the acceptance, and the favor that you show your people. Give us a love for that, a longing and hunger for that, so that our longing for our rights and our property and our money might fade, might seem less important. Help us to understand that these matters are relatively trivial and give us courage to trust that you are a just God who will make all things right, even as you are a just God who has shown mercy to us by executing your justice upon your Son. We pray these things in Jesus' name.